Hello, everybody, and welcome to our chatting with Charlie, EB5 Investor Outlook for August of 2023. My name is Joe Barnett. I am a partner at WR Immigration. And thank you so very much for joining us either live today on the webinar or if you're listening in on YouTube after we've recorded. It's a pleasure to have you here. It is a very exciting time in EB5 right now, and we have a lot to talk about today, so I want to jump right into it. I, of course, am joined by our director of Visa Consulting, Charlie Oppenheim. Hello, how is everybody today? And as well, we have our firm's managing partner and former AILA National Pass president, Bernard Wolfstorff, is here with us as well. Hi, Bernie. Thanks for inviting me, Joey. Uh, I think we've got an amazing uh, program today. This one's going viral because the information which we're going to provide is absolutely critical to any EB-5 investor or regional center operator. And of course, we have to say this doesn't constitute legal advice, but we would be happy to speak with anybody who is interested in doing EB-5 and do a free consultation to discuss your options and the amazing opportunities that are available that we will be discussing more in depth um, during the next 50 minutes or so. We also have uh, question and chat functions here. So if you're listening in and you have questions, please feel free to write them in. We will try to answer them uh, as we go through the presentation or at the end of the hour. So let's just get right to it. Um, WR Immigration, this is a top ranked US immigration law firm. We are consistently ranked as one of the best U.S. immigration law firms out there. Bernie just got another award for being the top U.S. immigration attorney in, in California, I think. That was last month, right? Uh, just uh, it's best lawyers, top of L.A. Um, top of L.A., now, excuse me. Yeah, the best lawyers in L.A. Now they want me to send a whole lot of money to buy an ad, so I'm not sure if it's a real one or not. But, hey, we're going to take <laughs> – credits wherever we can get them, right? Exactly. Well, I've been doing EB-5 for about 12 years. I joined this firm oh, just about seven years ago at this point because of their reputation in the field and in the industry. And it's, it's a great, great team that we have here. Um, we're very much cutting edge. Bernie and I both sit on the American Immigration Lawyer Association EB-5 committee. And whenever there is something new in EB-5, we know about it probably before most, and um, it's a great value to our clients, and we wish that you journey forward with us. So let's talk. Here's our roadmap for today. We're going to be talking about a lot of the statistics that have come out um, over the past couple of months. We're going to be talking about the Visa Bulletin and what we can expect when the new fiscal year starts and the Visa Bulletin for October 2023 is released um, in just a couple of weeks. And then we're going to be getting into um, more of our frequently asked questions and other great news that we have in particular for immigrant investors who are looking to do EB-5 now um, and, and the wonderful opportunity that exists for them at this time. So let's just get right into it. This here is an excerpt of the Visa Bulletin for September of 2023, which starts in two days. Um, and there are four visa categories for EB-5 now. Um, and Charlie, I'm gonna ask you this first question is, can, can you explain what, what we're looking at here on this page? And um, in the next couple slides, we're gonna get into the movement uh, and of China and India unreserved. But can you just kind of break down what these different visa categories are and, and what the opportunity is, I guess, today for those who invest in the set-aside categories? Sure. Uh, the, the top line where there you see the uh, unreserved, those are the original EB-5 categories which were established. And those numbers, there is, it's current for all chargeability. China and India have uh, final action dates to limit number use at this point. Then the Regional Integrity Act of March of 2022, uh, that bill 
established three new reserved categories, which each get a percentage of the overall EB-5 annual limit, with a rural set-aside getting 20%, high unemployment 10%, and the infrastructure getting 2%. All three of those reserved categories have been current since the uh, bill was passed in March of 2022, uh, and they remain current uh, through September, and I believe they will continue to be listed as current for October. Joey, can I jump in here? Um, you know, I was expecting you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you're going to have to shut me up um, from time to time. But, you know, if you're an immigrant and you look at the visa bulletin and you see a C, that's really an A triple plus. All right. Because if we are just extracting the EB5 stuff, if you look at all the other categories, from EB1, EB2, EB3, FB1, FB2, everything is backlogged. Everything is horribly backlogged. And yes, it's true. The China unreserved is backlogged and the India unreserved is backlogged. But current is like, I don't know, it's, it's mana from heaven, okay? And in terms of the RIA, which Charlie mentioned, if you are lawfully in the United States in valid status, that is other than on a visa waiver entry, which of course is valid status, but 90 days, you cannot adjust um, under 245 um, A or even K if you came in on an ESTA. But if you came in on a student visa, an H, an L, and sometimes even a B if you didn't enter with uh, immigrant intent. You can file an adjustment of status. And from a precaution point of view, you know, other than H or L, we recommend you wait at least 90 days so that you don't have preconceived intent issues. You can file an adjustment of status. And Joey, question to you, sir. Is it true that you got a whole bunch of EADs and advance parole approvals within three or four months of filing. I mean, this is like crazy. The only other people who are in this situation are immediate relatives, spouses, parents, and minor children of U.S. citizens. So, wow, this is those C's for all chargeability, which is the entire world, for China, which is backlogged in everything, for India, which is insanely backlogged, they are current for rural set asides, high unemployment and infrastructure projects, and you can get an EAD potentially within three to four months, although I think we have to caution, we don't know if that's aberrational or whether that is some sort of new processing time because we've got other cases, eight to 10 months, they haven't got their travel permit, they're getting their work permits. But is this is this what you're experiencing, Joey? That, that is what we're experiencing and it's a great opportunity. And, and, and to take a step back, the way the way that it works is, when you file your EB-5 case in one of these reserved categories, because it is current, you are also able to file an adjustment of status at the same time that you file your I-526. Your adjustment of status is based on the underlying EB-5 petition. So they're not going to adjudicate your adjustment of status until they adjudicate the underlying I-526 the EB-5 application. But in the meantime, you also are able to file for an EAD, an employment authorization document, and for advanced parole, These are cons which allows you to travel. That Those are considered interim benefits that you get as an um, adjustment of status applicant. And so you're able to get the right to work and the right to travel even before you're EB-5 case is approved. So Joey, um, let me push the envelope because I am an immigration lawyer and I like to go up it to the uh, edge, but not over the edge. Under 245K protection, you could technically have somebody who came on a tourist visa to visit their kid, stayed unlawfully, overstayed 179 days, but not 180, wait, not over 180, and you could then file a concurrent one step under one of these current categories and get um, 
back in lawful sta- or quasi lawful status and get your work permit and get your travel permit. This is like wow, bonanza. And these, I think, are the two best parts of this RIA that Charlie mentioned from an immigrant perspective, right? This is one of the few ways to follow that golden path to the green card. Absolutely. Or, or in another situation where you are in the United States on an H-1B and there's layoffs at your company and you're not able to find a job during that grace period. Then you're going to have to cash in your stock options, pull out your $800,000, which is the current minimum if you fit within one of these three categories, you know, the, the amount is reduced from a million fifty down to 800,000 um, if you fit in one of these categories. Now, Joey, yesterday was a good day for me. I got an email from our other partner, Vivian Zhu, and she sent me an approval of a 526. I hadn't seen one yet. I believe we are amongst the first in the country and these cases were filed eight to 10 months ago. This is completely unfair to my clients who've been waiting for years and years. But, you know, I'm not unhappy if, Joey, you win the million dollar lottery and you are richer than me. Who cares? Uh, good luck to you. Um, I'm happy for you. But we've got a whole bunch of clients where we filed these rural 526s, I hadn't seen what they've been approved, and they are getting approved in eight, nine, ten months, which is, I mean, just phenomenal, bearing in mind the current published processing times, right? I mean, this it's, is not on the our USCIS website, it's not on the IPO website, but if you go to our office at 1416 Second Street in Santa Monica, you will see beautiful mail coming in with approved 526 rules. Now, I haven't even determined this. Have we had three or have we had four? Do you know what the numbers are? Have you checked with Vivian this morning? How many? And maybe tomorrow it'll be 10. We don't know, but they seem to be pouring in as of yesterday. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the USCIS appears to be following what is in the Reform Integrity Act to prioritize the adjudication of petitions based on investments in rural areas and and you know we're going to get to a slide in just a little bit talking about USCIS processing and we have some investors who've been waiting you know three four years Charlie in past webinars you and I have talked about the possibility of these reserve visas going wasted based on USCIS processing times that have been ungodly long um, this in the past week the the script has been flipped and yeah, it it's very, very exciting for a lot of people, um, and in particular for Chinese nationals who filed in rural, um, there's no visa backlog because the RIA created new lines. And so because it is current, they should be able to quickly go and get an immigrant visa at the U.S. consulate in Guangzhou. Um, and, and this is, to be honest, it's, it's, it's unheard of. It's excellent news for our, for our clients. Um, and but, something that, to be honest, I, I didn't really expect this to come so quickly. It's, it's somewhat yeah. controversial because I was somewhat panicked and I was telling Charlie, you know, well, what's going to happen? Are these visas all going to get wasted because they're not adjudicating because it takes five years? Um, and this is a very controversial situation if you are in the high unemployment line. Um, I don't know if we've got any high unemployment approvals uh, under RIA yet. I'm hoping we will, but it seems like the ones that are starting to flood my front, our front desk are, are rural projects that are getting approved. So I want to tell everybody, please, when you make an investment, I, we don't give you investment advice, by the way, but if you make an investment, you know, the question is two issues. Number one, are you going to get your green card and when? And then, of course, there's a second issue, which is equally big, sometimes bigger, is, you know, if, if it's a loan model, when am I going to get my money back? And that's obviously the second issue, uh, but we won't get into the weeds on that. So, Joey, this is like, I mean, amazing news. And, Charlie, I think we can now have less worry that that these set-asides are going to get wasted, right? Is that is – Right. That... And, and, you know, this is a – this. 
concurrent filing ability is a very unique thing and it is providing a very uh, unique benefit to Chinese applicants where in the past most Chinese were processed overseas. Uh, so these these people that you described that are already legally in the US uh, potentially have a, a great benefit. And especially as you mentioned, uh, the people in the first, second and third preference categories have extended waits, probably six to eight years or more uh, if they're filing. So yeah, this does provide a, a very unique opportunity. And it's important to re uh, remind applicants that even if they may already have a petition filed in one of the other categories, they can also file a petition in the uh, fifth preference. You can have two places in line and well, you get your visa in whichever comes up first. Well, let me go one step further, Joey. You know, this news that I'm releasing today and, and hopefully we'll get your blog published later today or tomorrow because I want to get this news out to the rest of the world. But it raises another issue for me. I mean, if I'm sitting in one of these, I'm from China, for the born in China, chargeable to China. Um, I do not have a Hong Kong born wife or spouse. And, um, and I'm stuck with like a 2017 or 18 priority date. Is it now going to make sense for me to top up to, to, to see if I can take my 500,000 investment out, put in another 300,000 and refile a new petition under RIA, file an adjustment of status because I'm in the United States on an F1. Is this at all feasible, uh, Joey? Have you done it yet? The topping up thing and... What are the issues here? Are there concerns about job creation and meeting source of fund standards, the new source? What, what are the issues? Is topping up now viable? We jump to the front of the line. Uh, yeah. now, is that reasonable, Joey, to be able to I, top up? And, and would let, let me ask you so, differently. So, if you were a Chinese national sitting with a 2018 and you had extra 300,000 in the bank, would you seriously consider this? Absolutely. It's not a question. Uh, you're going to get your green card faster, it appears, going through these new set-aside categories than waiting in the visa backlog for unreserved. There are a couple of very technical issues um, around that, as you mentioned, related to job creation. Um, with source of funds, you're going to have to document the full 800K was lawfully obtained. Um, and you need to make sure that what was done back in 2017 and 18 was done properly. Um, there are some particularly uh, tricky issues that are on USCIS's radar with regards to path of funds, getting money out of certain countries and into the United States. But if you can work around that, and the regional center has filed a new I-956F showing how the project needs more money and how jobs will be created or have been created based on short-term bridge financing and is being replaced by EB-5 capital, then yes, that is a possibility, but it's something that we would need to work with a regional center on um, because the way that the RIA has been written is that the regional center first needs to file a project-based application before a new investor submits but, their own but 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 let me understand but in this. theory the answer is yes even though we have to file the 956 f that 956 f does not have to be approved correct in order to really have to have it confirmed that it's that it's been submitted but those approvals and we just got one last week by the way uh well done joey well that was just for that was just for a regional center designation not, oh, not an okay F. well anyway i get excited anyway every time i get an approval <laughs> uh at the end of the day topping up doesn't require an approval uh right. it it merely requires that you conform with the new standards so let's move on to the next slides but you know i just wanted people to see that when you're looking at a c here it may just look like a c to you but to an immigrant who is in a waiting line this is a quadruple A. This is A++ in terms of immigrant visa movement and lines and waiting lines, which is why Charlie Oppenheim, our guest, uh, is, is so important because, quite frankly, he's the only person that I'm aware of who truly understands these categories because, gosh, I wish I, I did, but Charlie is 
the expert. And I do want to mention, for those of you who haven't heard it, that's because Charlie was director of visa control for 23 years, the past 23 years until his recent retirement. Back to you, Joey and Charlie. What are we looking at here? So this here is a listing of the visa bulletin final action date for the past year. And in particular for those born in mainland China. And you can see how it has advanced slowly over the past year. And my question to you, Charlie, is we have a, a new batch of visas that come out in October. Um, and in the past, there's been advancements of the final action date when there's a new fiscal year. So my question to you is, what do you expect to see for unreserved China in next month's visa bulletin? I believe that the China date for October should advance to at least November 1st of 2015. Uh, and that the reason being that they have a brand new supply of numbers uh, under the 2024 limits. And the, uh, the category has had a er much earlier final action date throughout the year. Uh, so I see no reason why it should not advance to at least November 1st of 2015. And I want to real quick mention, we've been talking about the C, current, and the current means that numbers are immediately available for any applicant who has an approved petition. Uh, so that's an important thing, as you all mentioned. So numbers are immediately available for anybody that receives an approved petition. Yeah, and, and we've spoken about this on past webinars. You know, the C is important because it allows someone in the United States to file the adjustment of status. Um, but just because it's current at the time of filing does not necessarily mean it will be current at the time that USCIS adjudicates your I-526. And we're going to get into some of the data yeah. Um, yeah, about I, that. And and but but yeah. I just want people to be aware. You know, no, it's not I, going I, to yeah. stay current. Um, forever. It, it may exactly. not stay current, but at the end of the day, you know, I've always spoken about the green card and the red card. Um, the combo card being the red card and the green card. In many respects, if I was a multimillionaire, one day maybe, do I really care whether I have a green card or a red card? If the red card is giving me permission to travel in and out of the United States, and the red card is giving me the right to be employed on an unrestricted basis throughout the United States. Do I really care what color my card is? Because there is an argument that if I am a billionaire, that's not going to happen. Uh, if I'm a multimillionaire, I've got to do something called tax planning, which we don't talk about in these seminars. But if you're very wealthy, America has a very extensive tax regime where if you have a green card, you're taxable on worldwide income. But if you have a red card with an adjustment pending and you are spending most of the time out of the U.S. and most of your business is out of the U.S. and most of your homes are out of the U.S., I think there's some sort of argument that you may not even be a tax resident during this pending time. So it could even be advantageous to these. We've got to look at these cases not from the perspective of our average client who is a normal person, our average person, we're going to look at these cases from the perspective of a high net worth individual. Because if they're investing a million dollars, chances are they've got a five, ten million dollar plus net worth. And so being current allows you to file an adjustment, allows your kids to go to school, allows your kids after 366 days, and depending on which state you're in, and if the parents are residing in the U.S., California rules are quite complicated, but your kid might even be eligible for in-state tuition. Not that we're trying to save money for millionaires, but at the end of the day, the law is the law. And the current rules on residency for students this is a big issue. Joey, I know your kid's only four, but I have kids in college, and I'm proud to say my youngest son just got into USC. And the reason I'm still working so hard is I got to pay those school fees. I wish he went to UCLA where I would get in-state tuition. So it's a really big issue. And I know you've got two kids. Hopefully they'll be able to go to USC, but um, you know, resident status is a big issue. So I just want to throw in those issues from an investor perspective because they're pretty I, important. Thank you. I agree. 
Let's talk about India. This here is the same sort of chart, but rather than for China, it's for India. Um, and you can see that in this past fiscal year, there was some retrogression, um, actually some pretty serious retrogression. But again, come October, there's a new set of visas. And uh, Charlie, what do you anticipate seeing in the visa bulletin for October of 2023? Uh, for October, I would expect the India unreserved date to return to November 8th of 2019, and it may hold at that date for a period of time while uh, the State Department determines the demand, uh, incoming demand for numbers. But again, I think that it, India unreserved should advance to at, uh, November 8th of 2019. And, and I know Bernie was talking about the multimillionaires, but we also have many clients who are really putting together numerous sources of funds. Um, you know, they have some stock options based on their H-1B employer. They purchased a home and are getting a home equity line of credit. And then they're also getting a gift or a loan from a family member who, who lives abroad. You know, it's absolutely allowed to have multiple sources of funds. Um, and you just need to document where they came from and make sure that that, you know, you can explain that everything was lawfully obtained. Um, but that is what I am seeing in practice very, very often, in particular for folks who are younger, who are stuck in EB2, EB3 visa backlogs. I'm, I'm thinking like Indian nationals in the United States on H1B, where they want to take a little bit more control of their life. Um, and not just be waiting for the visa bulletin to advance. These folks are are looking at different sources and trying to figure out the best way for them to be able to afford the 800,000 minimum investment. And some of them as well are doing partial investments because the immigration law allows you to be actively in the process of investing at the time that you file your I-526. And so if the project that you're investing in allows for a lower investment amount, then we can file your EB-5 case as well as the adjustment, as well as the, for the EAD and the advanced parole with a lower amount than the 800K. And so there are opportunities out there for those who may not be able to afford the 800K. And we'll talk about some of the, the issues related to that um, at the end with our frequently asked questions, but it's something that I, I want people to understand as, as a possibility when you're thinking about EB-5. But, but, it, but there's also risk involved if you don't do it correctly at the end of the day. But Joey, I also want to uh, make a little joke here. Even if you are a multimillionaire, let me assure you, not many multimillionaires have a million dollars sitting in their bank account ready to wire transfer. Sure. And even if they did have a million dollars, I mean, you'd want to have it on your CD right now. You can get, what, 5 6% return or put it in bonds and stuff. So people don't want to just dump all their money into an EB-5 project where, you know, I hate saying this, but it's true. The good projects give very minimal returns. In fact, I almost tell people, hey, if the project is offering a substantial return, be careful because the good projects do very small, like 0.025%. These are not good financial investments. These are green card investments where the most important thing is to make sure you get your money back and your investment is collateralized and adequate security so you get your money back. You do not choose EB-5 because somebody's promising you a 10% return. In fact, if they're offering you 10%, you may want to um, have your financial specialist uh, understand why uh, they're doing it. We are not your financial specialist. We are your immigration advisor. And hopefully your immigration visa petition filer and your green card specialist. But I want to get back to the big point here. At the end of the day, let's get real. India approximately 70% of the H-1B folks are from India. I mean, our tech industry, our doctors, our underserved doctors. I mean, people are talking about the, the doctors in rural areas. I think 70, 80% of physicians in rural areas are like foreign nationals or from India. I mean, of absolutely vital role. But if you look at the India EB2 category, it's terrifying, it's shocking. And the EB3 category, and 
a lot of these folks are married, so that, that there's no way out. The only way out for many of these extremely successful uh, doctors in underserved areas, Indian techs, they could be managers, they could be vice presidents at Microsoft, and they still don't have their green card. EB-5 is a popular option. And here's my question to you, Joey. It appears that at one point, India was num- – China has always sort of been the biggest uh, where most of the investors come from. Um, right now, with this rural thing, we're seeing a lot of Chinese investors come in, but the numbers of Indians filing is very high right now. Is, is this correct? Is this what you're seeing? I mean, pretty much more than half the calls we're getting literally every day are from Indian nationals who are – they get it. They, they, they understand this better than you and I because they already um, – Moving and filing with the these backlog. cases, yeah. they understand the backlogs, right? Ab- absolutely. Charlie, what's your take on the sad situation of, I mean, even India First Pref, the Einsteins of, of India are still stuck in waiting lines, whereas under EB-5, yeah. I mean, it's pretty bleak out there for Indian EB-1, 2, and 3, right, Charlie? Yeah, uh, this, like I said earlier, this provides the uh, Indian applicants who have the means to do so to file under one of these uh, set aside categories. It provides them a an excellent opportunity if they're currently in the employment first, second, or third categories, because my uh, I would expect those dates to move forward very slowly in the future. Uh, people got used to the India and some of the employment dates moving very quickly in recent years because of the high limits. Starting in 2024, the limits are going to be returning to pre-COVID totals, which is going to slow the India and China employment first, second, and third forward movement of their dates and extend their wait times. And as far as I understand it, an Indian national can move from third to second and first, but an Indian national, even though they already have a petition, they cannot jump from one, two, or three to five, right? So you can move from three to one, two to one, one to three, blah, blah, up and down, but you cannot move from EB1 to EB5 and capture that old priority date. So refiling under new category is possibly the only option for a lot of people who want to get their green card before they retire or before they my age. For folks who have EB2, EB3 priority dates of, you know, 2018 and, and, and more recent than that, I think it's something you definitely need to be thinking about, potentially even, you know, earlier 2017, 16, 15 as, as well. You know, just to highlight, Charlie does speak at um, on another webinar that we do. So if you are in those visa backlogs and want some insight on how those will be moving, um, you should definitely take a look at our Chatting with Charlie webinar series on, on YouTube um, to discuss that. By the way, oh. just to give a little plug on that, we did uh, a webinar uh, 823 last week. It just got posted. I saw, by the way, Charlie, we had over 2,000 hits just yesterday in one day. So uh, that thing is, uh, is, is picking up steam um, and obviously spreading so for those of you who are interested, just do a YouTube search, just type in chatting with Charlie and you'll see it'll pop up. The next couple of slides, we're just going to be going through some data. We're not going to be digging too deep into it because we have too much other stuff to talk about. But if you're on YouTube, pause the video and you can take a look more in depth. This here just shows how many cases USCIS has been completing, both the I-526 and the I-829. And really what I wanted to sh- show here is if you look at that last bar all the way to the right, they're actually making some serious improvements in I-526 processing, um, not just pre-RIA, so cases that were filed back in 2019 that have sort of been in limbo for the past few years, but also these new rural projects I anticipate that we're going to start seeing that blue bar continue to grow based on what I'm seeing on the ground. Um, Bernie, anything else you wanted to add here? I just want to uh, shout the word hallelujah um, loud because my poor clients, um, I mean, honestly, you look at that and there's excitement because, you know, we we, were up to what, just over a thousand per quarter. But realistically, look at where we were in FY2018 with 
five thousand. So it's still only at twenty twenty five percent of where we should be, quite frankly. I, I agree, but it is good news in particular oh, yeah. for our existing clients. I'd say that they are they're improving. Um, they're and, improving. And hats off. Thank you. Thank you yeah. to IPO. Thank you to the leadership for addressing this issue because my clients have quite honestly been quite frustrated. We told them, look, two to three years of processing and we ended up with like four. And you can blame COVID so much, but people don't remember, you know, blame COVID, blame all these other things. But at the end of the day, people want their green card. Right. And what I'm seeing just based on the approvals that we're getting um, case that they have begun to adjudicate cases that were filed in October of 2019. So that's that's great because just a few months ago um, they were in the summer. So they really are making some serious uh, indents on the pending backlog there. And we um, don't want to get into too much of it uh, here because we, we're going to release some data, but there are a lot of RFEs on source of funds and path of funds. And if you are working with an inexperienced EB-5 lawyer, you know, I love saying Joey uh, gave compliments to our team, but I'm going to be somewhat arrogant and say that we think we've got probably the best source of funds team. Uh, a lot of Chinese national really understand this issue. And I just want to warn you folks, the last thing you want to do is be waiting three or four years and then get an RFE uh, because your exchanger was not licensed and, and, and you've got to fix that problem. So um, choosing the project, there are two things on EB-5. Number one, choosing a good project. Yes, that's number one for sure. Absolutely. But choosing a competent team who can do a source of funds, everybody's going to tell you they know what they can do and what they've been doing. But I like bragging, and it's true, that our team has filed over 5,000 cases. And uh, at that point, you start knowing how to do these type of things. Uh, if you can say, well, I've done 10 or 20. Joey, if I said to you I've done 10 EB-5 cases, does that mean I know how to do source of funds? Well, I've done 10 in the past month. <laughs> show off uh joey you're older Sorry. than you look although you're starting to look your age but uh you've been doing these for years what i'm really saying folks is everybody says yeah my money is clean oh this is easy it's all lawful and you know what we're going to give you a hard time i am just complying with the ria and they want to make sure that money is lawfully sourced and this is a huge issue because you do not want oh joey even worse in your previous chart, you showed all these approvals of 829s. This is my favorite cross-examination question. Is it or is it not true that they are raising source of funds issues at the 829 stage unfairly? And it's pretty hard to fix them at that stage, correct? Your, your family's now been living in the United States with green cards for five or six years, and they're raising source of funds issues six years later? Really? Yeah, so someone who has an approved I-526 who's already gone through USCIS scrutiny and got an approval previously, um, there are, have been reports of USCIS coming back at the I-829 stage and, and making sure, again, that they didn't make a mistake of law and, and re-adjudicating the source of funds or path of funds is actually, I think, what they're more focusing on than Correct. the source of funds. But um there have been that has unfortunately been coming. Um, Passive funds is when I transfer my money from my bank account to my Cayman Islands account to my Bahamas account through my Mexico account into my Bank of America account. And the government wants to know why and how did I do this? Right. Exactly. So this chart, we're not going to spend too much time on, um, but it just shows this is the data that USCIS released um, as it relates to EB-5 filings and the two big numbers here is that since the RIA was passed in March, there have been 1,127 I-526Es, that's cases filed by regional center investors, and 90 direct EB-5 standalone investor filings. Um, and both direct and regional center can qualify for the reserve visa categories. Um, and, and what I really wanted to talk about here and this kind of gets into the discussion we were having before with Charlie is, you know, visa availability, you know, what is the demand for these visas? Are we going to continue to see that C in the visa bulletin? 
moving forward for these reserve visas. Um, and so, Charlie, if you don't mind, could you kind of explain how it works with visa numbers and I-526 filings and, and, and how those can sort of correlate? Right. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, each of the three reserved set-asides gets a, a percentage. And the numbers which were not used during the current fiscal year 2023, any that go unused will be carried over and added to the 2024 annual limit. Uh, so based on this data that the Immigration Service has published, it appears at this time that, the, and with these figures showing three applicants per case or 1.5, with either one, there are going to be more numbers available for use during fiscal 2024 than there uh, will be applicants. Therefore, I believe that it that it is extremely likely that all the reserved categories will be current throughout 2024. And that statement is based on the data that immigration has released uh, so far, but it is very encouraging. At earlier uh, webinars, I've been mentioning through at least uh, May, but it's very encouraging that the USCIS is now publishing data. Hopefully they will continue to publish it on a timely basis, maybe even with a little bit more detail by the category, uh, which the three set-asides, and hopefully at least the top five countries uh, of filing in each way. But again, based on the previous slides total, next year's limit for the reserved overall is gonna be about 7,800 and rural alone, 4,900. And the previous slides showed there were less than 4,000 uh, even with three applicants per case. So it's very encouraging. And again, it's uh, important for people that are considering this program to file in a timely manner because you always want to be at the front or as near the front of any line that may develop in the future. Joey and I are experienced immigration lawyers, but this is the value of, of Charlie Oppenheim because quite frankly, he's the only one who can really do this kind of analysis. Um, there is a very good chance that visa availability will remain current for adjustment filing under these categories right through till September of next year. Previously, Charlie was predicting maybe only May or, or, or June. So this is incredible news um, with the fact that we're now getting approvals on these cases, with the fact that the Indian retrogression is so bad there's only a narrow window and a narrow door. And Charlie's saying that door could well be open through to September next year. And by the way, uh, Joey, how long does it take you normally to put these source of funds packages together and all these documents and show that I transferred these things, but it was all legal and correct? It depends on how organized and motivated the client is and translations and things like that. But I would say generally around four weeks or so. Our, our team oh, is wow. pretty, good. Our team is pretty good. good, pretty fast about it. Yeah. Within a month. Not bad. Not bad. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of Indian nationals, a lot of Chinese taking advantage of this. And something you advised me earlier, Charlie, uh, it's really important to file your case and get your priority date. And it's only by filing your 526 that you get your place in line kind of like going to the DMV um, without an appointment and you have to take a number and wait till that number gets called. So you really want to get there at five o'clock in the morning, right? Uh, otherwise, you're going to be sitting till four in the afternoon. So Charlie, can you just briefly summarize uh, how do we acquire a priority date? It's the filing of the 526, correct? Correct. It's the filing of the petition uh, and not to be con uh, confused with the approval. So the day, if I were to file my petition today, then my pet my priority date would be today's date. And that will govern when my case can receive final action in the future. So again, it is very important to always try to get it time file in a timely manner and try to be as close to the front of any line that may develop in the future. And a line will develop at some point, but at this point, it looks like we should be remain current throughout fiscal 2024. 
Right. And, you know, this um, number that we had before, you know, the, the 1,217, we don't know who filed those and we don't know what visa category they filed in. Um, you know, how many of these are Chinese nationals? How many of these are Indian nationals? How many have gone in rural? How many have gone in high unemployment? We, nobody has that data except for USCIS and they, they don't appear to be willing to share it at this time. Um, and so it can be difficult to kind of advise, well, which is gonna be the fastest? Um, at this point, I think what only immigration attorneys can advise is kind of based on math, you know? Um, and it's, it's one of those things, and we've talked about this in past webinars, is as soon as the data comes out that there aren't that many Indian nationals that filed in high unemployment, well, then all of these Indian nationals are going to look at it and they're going to go to high unemployment, right? Everyone's going to go zig when previously everyone has zagged. So it's going to be this moving goal that we, we, we don't always have the best advice for. And I don't think any immigration attorney can really um, give, you know, 100% guarantee on, right. on, on what that will be. Until the dollar is published it's in... and until Charlie's uh, yeah, and, commented on it. Exactly. I don't want to spend too much time on this. This is just something that we've compiled showing visa issuance by U.S. consulates and embassies abroad over the past, I don't know, 12, 13 months or so. Um, and you can see in the bottom right there that there's been nearly 12,000 of these issued during that time. So the, the Department of, of State is, in my opinion, it's too slow um, and it is taking too long, but it's not like they're not issuing EB-5 visas. They are doing that. Um, and you can see in particular um, that most of it is happening in, in Guangzhou and a lot of it happened at the end of last fiscal year. And so I'm expecting when the data comes out that we'll see good numbers again um, for July, August, and September of 2023. But Mumbai, Ho Chi Minh City, uh, not exactly too shabby, right? I mean, the numbers are okay considering, and the numbers in Guangzhou seem to be but uh, we might still have as many as um, 2,000 um, what I call wasted visas this year because the fiscal year is going to end in literally 30 days. Yeah, it's important to note also these are strictly issuances in the unreserved category. And right. I would actually, I would expect that uh, whenever the data is published for unreserved number use for fiscal 2023, it should be very close to the annual limit of approximately approximately 9,000 or 9,500 numbers. If it's not very close to that total, the question would be, why wasn't the China unreserved fifth preference date advanced or possibly even the India date advanced to allow the quote, otherwise unused numbers to be used and not wasted? Uh, so that that'll be an interesting thing to see when the uh, number use status for 2023 begins to be published, uh, probably not until sometime in November. This here just shows how many in fiscal year 2023 have been issued. Again, this it's 6,243. This is through June of 2023. And these are just consular processing. We do not have data related to adjustment of status, but I like this chart and we're going to, and what this, the trend shows is that more of these EB-5 visa numbers are being given out by USCIS than through US consulates and embassies abroad. And with the current adjustment of status option now, I anticipate that we're going to continue to see this, this percentage of adjustment of status grow. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Uh, in the past, probably the vast majority of the EB-5 numbers were processed overseas, primarily by Guangzhou. And as you said, that with the concurrent filing option, the uh, immigration should start to process much larger amounts of numbers in the future. So um, we wanted to talk about some frequently asked questions. This is based on conversations that I have every day with prospective immigrant investors and just trying to give some bullet points to help um, people who are listening to this webinar um, understand some of the, maybe some of the more tricky issues. So we talked about actively in the process of investing um, earlier where you don't have to invest the full $800,000 minimum investment. 
There are some tricky issues here. Number one, um, you should make sure that you identify where the rest of the investment is going to be coming from, and you need to stick to that story. Otherwise, USCIS could say that there has been a material change and that the facts that you included at the time of I-526 filing have changed, and therefore you may need to be required to refile. Um, so please, when you're doing this, you need to make sure that you can identify where the rest of the money is going to be coming from. Well, we own this home, we put it on for sale. Once we have a buyer come in, then we'll be able to use the sale proceeds and transfer it to complete the investment. Here's the appraisal of the house. Here's how we earn the money to purchase the house in the first place. Here's the title deed that I have showing that I own the house. This is the type of evidence that we would want to include if you are going to be actively in the process of investing. It's something that you really should speak with an experienced immigration attorney on because every situation is different, um, but it is um, absolutely possible to file and get your spot in the waiting line without the full investment amount. Number two, travel restrictions with an adjustment of status pending. So the way that it works is that when you file your adjustment of status, um, we mentioned this before, you're also able to file for advanced parole. That's considered an interim benefit during the time in which your adjustment of status application is pending. The processing times for that advanced parole ranges anywhere from three months to I'd say up to 15 months based on what I'm seeing. If you have not entered the United States on an H or an L visa and you're not maintaining H or L visa status, you are not allowed to leave the United States until you have that advanced parole in hand. If you do, USCIS will say that you have abandoned your adjustment of status application and you will likely need to do consular processing for EB-5. So there are some travel restrictions during that limited time that many folks, when I discuss it, is they're willing to sacrifice some short-term travel in order to meet the overall goal of getting the green card and being able to work in the United States in the meantime. There's this memo called the Cronin Memo, and there are some differences for those who are in the United States on an H and L who leave the United States and re-enter and continue to work with their H and L if before the advanced parole is approved. In those situations, the adjustment of status is not deemed abandoned, but the advanced parole application is. And so, again, something that you need to speak with an experienced immigration attorney on, um, and in particular, before you file the adjustment of status application. Um, Bernie, I know we were talking about this before. Anything else you wanted to add on, on that one? For all of your information, all of your most complicated cases, other issues like inadmissibility. Oh, I have a criminal conviction. Oh, I have uh, DUIs. I mean, you need to talk to us about those. Uh, yeah, I had a shoplifting conviction from 30 years ago. Yeah, we want to know about it. For naturalization, it's not a requirement to naturalize, but many individuals want to do it. Any time that you spend in the United States as a conditional green card holder can count towards that five years that you need as a green card holder before applying for naturalization. That's something that is a common question. Um, one thing that um, you know many folks ask about is, well, can I lose my investment capital? The answer is yes, you, you can. The EB-5 program requires the money to be at risk, but at risk does not necessarily mean risky. And that's why it's so important to speak with a financial advisor or a registered broker dealer um, to help guide you with regards to the investment side. As immigration attorneys, as Bernie mentioned before, we don't provide investment advice. We're not licensed to do so. It's not ethical for us to do so. Um, we help you get the green card. Um, we can tell you about a regional center's reputation, about their track record, about their ability to repay money from other projects in the past. But every project is different, and it's absolutely possible for you to get the green card because jobs have been created, but the investment capital is delayed on return because they aren't able to refinance or they aren't able to sell or something along those lines. So those are things that we help folks understand, but really you do need to work 
with a experienced financial professional on that investment decision. I want to mention one more small issue, uh, which is, of course, a big issue. And that is RIA is really a good law in many respects, particularly in terms of investor protections. Uh, and it brings RIA and the EB-5 industry and full and clearly under the guise of SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, for both the federal and state level. So, um, you know, what I'm saying is that these are securities and these are regulated securities and compliance is a big issue. And I'm just saying this because there are a lot of newcomers who don't seem to understand that this is not just an immigration program. It is also involving securities law and the SEC is not an agency one wants to mess with. So please be careful. Please ensure that we have compliance. If somebody's offering you a $50,000 payment, uh, you know, is that in fact going to violate securities law? So I just want to do a big shout out on that issue. Please be aware of it. I guess really the last thing that I wanted to say, and we spoke about this a bit, is, is source of funds. Um, please talk with a, an experienced EB-5 attorney about this. Um, the government acts like a forensic accountant, and they want to see a lot of documents. And that's where there's a lot of back and forth with your immigration attorney and preparing your case to make sure that it's approved. A lot of clients who come to us um, are looking at project options and at the same time in parallel working with us to get their source of funds ready. Your source of funds is the same no matter what project you choose. So work with an immigration attorney. Make sure that you can document it. Make sure that it's all ready to go so that when you finally make that investment decision, there's nothing else delaying the, the transfer of the funds, which is required before filing the application so that you can get your spot in line. What we're saying here is the first thing you need to do in an EB-5 is retain a competent immigration lawyer to work on your source of funds. The first person to retain in this process is not necessarily the project or the investment or putting your money in. The first person to call is 1-800-VISA-LAW and ask for Joey Barnett, correct? Absolutely. And in fact, we advise folks not to make the investment into the EB-5 project until we've had a chance to really review everything. Once the money has been transferred, it's kind of too late because the money came from a source already. We want to be able to document it and to make sure that we have a good strategy for your case to get approved. It's smart to be diligent here and to be conservative and cautious and slow moving so that you ultimately get that approval. Joey, fantastic. Let's try and go through our chat and our Q&A, make sure everybody yep. gets their questions answered because when you call WR Immigration, you're going to get answers. All right. So the first one is from our friend Ed Bishara in Florida. Hey, he Ed, how are you doing today? He asks, to take advantage of the set-aside visa categories, do Chinese and Indian investors, and really anyone, have to invest after the RIA 2022? So I think another way to ask this question is, is do pre-RIA investors qualify for these set-asides? Um, and the way that the Department of State has answered this um, to date is the answer is no. And that's why we were talking about before the possibility of topping off, making a new investment, adding that 300K and getting into one of the new reserve visa categories. And, and even worse than this, my friend has actually litigated this in the context of infrastructure, infrastructure. projects. And, yeah. and, and sadly, the courts didn't agree with it, right, at the end of the day. And USCIS and the government took the position that these set aside reserved visa categories because are- Because it's a brand new law that was uh, unfiled under the old law. This is a new law. Therefore, there's no carryover. Uh, even though the definition of rural is exactly the same, we don't give it out. Exactly. And ask another question related to actively in the process of investing. Um, yes, I think it is smart. He's asking, is it advisable um, for those who are actively in the process of investing to submit evidence of liquid assets as the basis for the subsequent investment in a few months? And we discussed this live previ previously. Yes, you should identify that. Um, and if it were me, I, you know, what would happen is after you make that subsequent investment and, and complete the balance of it, you would interfile. Um, and USCIS generally does a pretty good job of connecting the interfiling with the initial filing. 
um, but they could issue a request for evidence um, later on and you have to resubmit those documents. Um, again, this is something that you really should be speaking uh, with a, a immigration attorney on since it's very case specific. Here is a question, Bernie, I'm gonna shoot this one to you. E2 visa interviews are backlogged. Can you schedule multiple interview times at different posts without canceling each other? No, um, do not do this. Um, you know, it's really gonna upset the State Department and the consular officer. Um, do your homework before, find out how long this particular post, and then there's a jurisdictional issue. I mean, if you're a third country national, so no. Uh, this is not exactly an EB-5 question. It's an E-2 question. But no, no consular – do your consul shopping before you file your case because consuls are going to get really upset if you find that you are wasting their resources. So don't do it. I answered two uh, in the chat, but a question he had about the travel restrictions for – someone who is an O non-immigrant visa status who has filed EB-5 and has an adjustment of status pending. Um, he's asking, should I not travel outside of the United States before I get my advanced parole approved? Um, I, I wouldn't travel outside of the United States. No, not just you, Joey. I mean, an O-1 is not a dual intent visa and until they get the advanced parole, I'm giving you 100% no. You're on an O-1. If you travel without your advanced parole, Hello, goodbye. You are stuck abroad until you can transfer that file. So no, you will not be able to re-enter. So absolutely 100%. Do not travel unless you have a valid H or L stamp or advanced parole approval or you are abandoning your adjustment. You could travel and re-enter as long as the O visa is valid and as long as you're continuing doing the O visa activities, but your adjustment is going to be denied. A CBP officer technically could say, oh, it's not a dual intent visa. I'm not going to readmit you. The answer is no, you really shouldn't do that. Stay in the United States until you have your advanced parole. Um, can you travel with a pending advanced parole renewal application? Good question. Because if you asked this question two years ago, uh, the answer was no. And it appears that the answer is now yes. And I am not giving that to you as legal advice. So if you're not my client, contact your attorney, have them research this to find out which way the wind is blowing as of today. But my understanding is that um, the fact that you have an approved AP, an initial AP, and the fact that you have one pending uh, does not prohibit you from re-entering. But this is a very much a snake pit arena where USCIS went one way and now they've come back another way. So I'm not giving you legal advice on this call. Uh, consult with your attorney. If you don't have one, call 1-800-JOEY-BARNETT. Actually, that was asked by Mayank, who is one of my clients. Um, uh -oh. Hi, Mayank, how are you doing? Good to hear from you. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Um, and, and I guess I'd also say is, you know, when you're coming back in, you're not dealing with USCIS, you're, you're dealing with CBP. CBP. Um, and so USCIS's position may not really matter so much. Um, they can still give you trouble when you come in. My position would be um, don't travel unless you have an approved advanced parole. No, they haven't approved. They have an extension pending is what I understand the fact was. Oh, got it. So, but if the initial advanced parole is no longer valid and you're waiting for that extension to be approved, I would say no, do not. We need to talk about that offline as well before we give you uh, specific advice. Yeah. Uh, I'm not email giving, me. Yeah. I'm not. Yeah, please. Let's just look at that and research. There's another interesting question is, can you expedite an AP? The answer is yes, but please be aware. Number one, it, it, it what does work is an immediate, a critical medical emergency. You know, father's having cancer surgery next week and he's 85. That may be a winning uh, fact pattern, but the expedite really uh, varies from city to city. You will be interviewed, and you better make sure that you have compelling, accurate, not phony evidence uh, to support your AP. Okay, our last question. It's not EB-5 related. It looks like it's a, a family-based um, one. He has a priority date of January 2017, the Visa Bulletin for this category has been stuck for the past couple of years. Are there any hopes for this category in fiscal year 2024? Um, Charlie, can I ask that one to you? 
Sure. I would expect that the uh, India and the F2B date to start advancing during fiscal 2024. At this time, it would be impossible to say by how much this person asking this question should refer to the application filing dates. That will give you an idea of where the final action date will be eight to 12 months in the future. Thank you. Okay, I think we have one final question. Um, it's related to the Child Status Protection Act. Um, they're asking, when a child dependent has aged out under Chart A, but not under Chart B, can the child now file an adjustment of status if the parents were able to complete consular processing and get their green card within one year? We need to see more specific facts. I mean, you can't age out under chart A and not chart B. The question is, did you seek to acquire within one year under chart B and in fact freeze by filing your AOS because DOS and USCIS have a different position. USCIS's position is good. And the good news is Joey and um, our associate Kim and to a lesser extent me, we've just completed a substantive article on this very topic. Wait for the article. It's coming oh. out tomorrow. It yeah. really depends on what steps you've taken because we don't know if paying the visa fee, for example, or filing a DS-260 is an adequate lock for USCIS. So we need more facts on this kind of case. But there is a terrible situation where USCIS has taken a position which even allows you to retroactively correct this uh, as outlined in your very substantive article that is going to be published uh, in the next day or two. So go to the wrimmigrationwolfstorff.com website. You'll see this article coming up in the next day or two, which uh, goes into the weeds on this and points out the inconsistency between USCIS and DOS. We've got one more question um, Sorry, I'm not giving you an answer because we need more facts. We have one more anonymous question. The last question of the day, EB3ROW, do you expect it to be current in October? No. no. No, that's what I thought. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to bounce back that quickly, right? No, I mean, it, for EB3, rest of world, uh, for October, I think that it'll get back to June 1st of 2022, but it will. I do not expect it to go current in the foreseeable future. Where else in the world are you going to get answers to that questions other than with what we're now calling CWC, chatting with Charlie? Charlie, thank you so much because you are the only person in the world who can provide these answers. Joey, thanks for your in-depth analysis. Wait, I'm not the host today, but uh, I do talk too much. So thank you, everybody. Tell your friends about chatting with Charlie, EB5. This is once a month. You can't get this information anywhere else, folks, other than with Joey and chatting with Charlie. So thank you, everybody, for participating. Please repost us when we share. And thank you, Anna, for your excellent work behind the scenes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Have a Bye. wonderful Bye. day.